Good day. Um, welcome back to Ancient History um, 361 at University of Albany. Um, some of you may remember me um, from such moments as the first half of last semester, Michael Taylor, Assistant Professor of History um, at U Albany. Um, so I thought I would give my first online lecture um, on the topic of transitions, um, perhaps worthwhile since we are suddenly, shockingly transitioning from an in-person course where we all come together as a community of scholars, we get to engage in face-to-face -face conversation, back and forth in lectures, people can ask questions, I can pose questions. Um, that's all gone now. It's just me talking to my screen um, and you listening. Um, uh, so we're in a moment of transition uh, and Given that it's a moment of transition, um, expect things to change. I'm going to try to make these lectures more interactive, to be able to include slides, to have less images of me and my cluttered study um, uh, for you to suffer through. Um, but I'm, I'll be honest, I'm still working through the technology, um, and I myself have been impacted by suddenly having to homeschool my kids who previously were in school. Um, sharing this space and technology with my wife, who's now working remotely. Um, I know many of you are also facing challenges. Um, as I said in my email, and I just want to reiterate it, um, I don't think that this course should be anybody's first priority. Um, it's not my first priority. Everybody's first priority should be first staying healthy, and second, taking care of those people that you love. Um, so make sure that that is your first priority. Um, we are going to muddle through this course. Um, so that you can get your credit, um, so you Albany can keep your tuition, and so I can also continue to collect my salary. I hope that is mutually beneficial for all of us. Um, but I also acknowledge that this is a muddle through, um, and uh, we're all going to just do the best that we can, um, uh, even if uh, it's perhaps not ideal. Um, so we're transitioning, and as with many moments of transition historically, there is a great deal of uncertainty, um, and it's therefore kind of appropriate that we left off in this course um, at a great moment of transition, or at least a moment that ancient historians have usually assigned as a moment of transition between traditional chronological phases, between the Archaic Age, conventionally defined as, say, from the late 8th century down to 479, to the Classical Age. Um, and of course, it's worth just reiterating, those are modern impositions upon the past. Um, while the Greeks are pretty happy with the way things go in 479, the fact that they've beaten the Persians at Plataea and Michaelae, um, uh, no one says, oh my god, it's 479, we've beaten the Persians, and the Classical Age is here. Um, uh, uh, and that's uh, a much later imposition. Um, indeed, even though we refer to uh, classical Greece you know, constantly, we should note that's a Latin term, um, uh, the idea of, of being classical, of being excellent. Um, so again, this is an imposition of people um, post facto. Um, uh, so um, and inherently we're imposing a, a schema upon the past. And uh, I think, as always, it's worth interrogating the extent that this schema is accurate or authentic, um, uh, because um, I always feel that while you know we should accept these as impositions upon the past, arguing about those impositions and uh, you know debating the merits or lack thereof of imposing a chronological framework, um, I think actually helps us to understand the past better. Um, to understand continuity and change and to try to grapple with what, uh, what moment actually embodies either a loss of continuity or a series of cascading changes that brings us into a different world. Um, and I, here I think we should be um, honest. Uh, this is an arbitrary date, right? We've picked a, a, a military event, the end of the Persian Wars, admittedly a significant and important military event. And we've decided that the Greek, the, the history of a you know, significant chunk of humanity somehow changes. Um, and of course, uh, again, not everything changes. So why, why, why did we pick this date aside from there was a big battle and, and uh, you know, it's a, the big battle makes it a sufficiently dramatic 
and momentous point um, from which to uh, go forward into a new era, at least if you're trying to create uh, a useful analytic framework for understanding the past. Um, well, some of the reason that we treat this as a new era, and this actually may not be an entirely good reason, is the fact that we're seeing a shift in our major literary sources. So Herodotus, who has been our primary source for what we know about the Archaic Age, even though sometimes he gives us more the civic myth or the local folklore, um, you know, the, the only reason we know about someone like, say, Cylon um, or Croesus, a, a lot of it has to do with Herodotus, and then maybe a, a, a little bit of additional information around Herodotus. Um, well, Herodotus is writing precisely for the point of describing the Persian Wars. And when the Persian Wars are over, Herodotus stops writing, um, maybe getting old and sick and dying. Um, so he's probably wrapping up in the late, sorry, early 420s. Um, he knows that the Peloponnesian War has started. He seems to uh, allude to this fact late in his histories. Um, but his histories themselves end with the conclusion of the Persian Wars in 479. Um, and then a new source, Thucydides, who is starting to write probably in the... Uh, either late 420s or maybe probably more likely in the in the uh, uh, 14s, I guess we would say, um, uh, somewhat after probably 423 when he's exiled from Athens. Um, so Thucydides picks up. Um, Thucydides, as we'll see, does not like Herodotus at all. Thucydides thinks Herodotus is a, is a bad historian. Thucydides dislikes Herodotus's, uh, Herodotus's uh, naive embrace of, of folklore and superstition. Um, but Thucydides does Herodotus the favor of picking up exactly where Herodotus leaves off. So Herodotus leaves off at the end of the Persian Wars. Thucydides, who really wants to talk about the Peloponnesian War, nonetheless uh, writes a bridging chapter to describe uh, the roughly 50 years that takes place before his main story actually picks up. And so just from a perspective of what's our primary literary source for the period before 479 Herodotus, after 479 Thucydides, and therefore uh, people you know who define the boundaries of Greek history say, well, the classical age begins in 479 because um, I'm using Thucydides now. Um, that's maybe not a natural, though we should say that's actually not a particularly good reason um, to put a chronological boundary there, right? That's just the coverage of your sources. But that doesn't necessarily mean day-to-day -day life has dramatically changed, say, between 481 and, and uh, 478. Um, and, and furthermore, um, Thucydides himself only grudgingly covers the, the big period from you know, 478 down to the 430s. He really wants to talk about the Peloponnesian War. Um, which which uh, starts officially in 431. He's again, it's just a, it's sort of this bridging chapter um, to sort of explain how we get the sort of the story so far, um, how we get to the the main topic of his history. Um, so on one, I think that's why this date is commonly used because people who spend a lot of time reading these histories are the people who have given us our chronological framework. Um, but we should acknowledge that that's kind of arbitrary. Um, you know, if Thucydides had just said, well, I'm going to start in 440 or 435 or 431 with the start of the war, it's not impossible that we would speak of the classical age um, beginning with when Thucydides starts his history. Um, now, that said, um, it's not just people who read literary histories of ancient Greece. It's not just the historiographers who influence our chronological framework. Um, it's also people who do archaeology. It's also people who uh, look at Greek art and archaeology. And here, the Persian Wars are a real watershed. Um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that our most important corpus of Greek art, Greek architecture, the, 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 the material splendor of Greece, um, not exclusively, but predominantly comes from Athens. Um, which does indeed have a, a, a massive efflorescence um, uh, in the 5th century, the so-called golden age of Athens, 
Um, this efflorescence is, is efflorescence is largely largely powered and funded by the fact that if, that Athens acquires a, um, a substantial empire and exploits that empire to beautify its city. But when the classical archaeologists and the classical art historians want to find beautiful things, um, they are heavily clustered in Athens. Again, the product of this broader um, uh, topography of Athenian imperialism. Um, now, here the Persian Wars are a jarring disconnect. I mean, Athens had been a powerful and flourishing and wealthy city prior to the Persian Wars, although nowhere near as imperial as it is after the Persian Wars. Um, but it is actually important, if you're trying to understand, say, Greek high material culture, um, that the Persians trash Attica. They tear everything down. They trash rural sanctuaries, they trash the Acropolis, they tear down the great temples on the Acropolis, the Hecatompodon temple, the hundred footer temple, um, the archaic um, Parthenon, the archaic temple to Athena. They ruin everything. The, the Acropolis um, is a huge pile of rubble that the Athenians actually sweep away and use as um, fill as they try to reconstruct their city after the war. And this actually creates a huge disconnect if you're interested in the classical art and archaeology of Athens. Because in many ways, the Athenians have a clean slate. Um, they're not um, you know, trying to build up on, uh, you know, well, we have this old beautiful building and this old beautiful building and, and we need to reposition our more modern 5th century building uh, uh, to sort of play off this old Hecatompedon temple. They're literally building on a, a huge pile of cleared rubble. Um, so therefore, from the perspective, again, of the art historian and the perspective of the, uh, of the um, archaeologist and, and architect, um, this is a huge discontinuity between what archaic Athens had looked like, again, which we, we mostly only know because we've excavated the, the dump, the pile of uh, the fill, the rubble that is sort of swept away, um, and then the sort of classic, classical contours of 5th century Athens, including most famously uh, the iconic Parthenon up there on the Acropolis. So again, if you're someone who values the beautiful things of Greece, 479 does represent a, a moment of discontinuity, the moment when whole styles of archaic art and architecture in Athens are literally turned to rubble. And then this allows subsequently the new styles, the distinctive styles of the classical age to, uh, to you know, colonize this void. Um, now again, if we're trying to understand people's day-to-day -day lives, um, this may be less of a discontinuity. Um, again, this is a this is a, a transition that is that the people who study um, uh, the, the topography of the or the urban topography of Athens are going to be much more sensitive to um, than necessarily the Athenians themselves. Were, although many of them would have been well aware of the destruction that their city had uh, suffered um, and the subsequent efforts to rebuild and uh, beautify and even glorify um, their waxing. Um, uh, imperial, increasingly imperial community. So these are some transitions that I'm trying to simply present from the perspective of people who read literary history, people who read, um, uh, 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 people who do art and architecture, you know, the, the, in some ways the sort of uh, focus of our discipline can force us to see transitions that it may have been less apparent to people on the ground. Um, so while it is perhaps an imperfect transition, um, there's no question that the mid-5th century feels very, very different from, say, the turn of the 6th to the 5th century. Um, so whether or not 469 is exactly a, a precise, razor-fine transition, although, again, you have this huge geopolitical event, the, the fact that the Greeks have defeated Xerxes' expeditionary uh, force, the fact that this has focused um, uh, uh, definitions of Greek identity, particularly um, uh, around uh, the, the two kind of poles of Athens and Sparta. This is a big event, um, an event that we should discount, even if it's possible that there are you know, peasants in Thessaly or Boeotia who aren't particularly touched by it. Um, um, so again, 479 is a geopolitical moment, but 
the world does feel, I think, quite different um, uh, as we move from 479 into the 5th century. Um, and some of those differences, um, uh, in fact, I think a lot of those differences um, do very much focus on Athens. And so um, when we talk about these transitions, um, it's possible these transitions are felt much less elsewhere, um, but are felt dramatically in this, um, in, in, you know, for our purposes, incredibly wealthy, powerful, prosperous polis um, in Attica. Um, uh, some of those transitions are going to be geopolitical. Um, Athens uses the aftermath of the Persian Wars, as we'll be talking about this week, um, to form a formidable um, empire in the Aegean, uh, an empire that increases Athens' wealth, that increases its uh, economic prosperity, um, that, it, that serves to exploit mostly other Greek communities, in some instances uh, more brutally than the Persians had ever exploited any Greek community. Um, and this, of course, is, is going to have a number of follow-on effects, like the erection of the Parthenon. Um, it's going to allow the Athenians to uh, engage in a cultural efflorescence that includes the invention of a whole host of new literary genres, um, including tragedy, um, uh, comedy, um, and these are directly the product of the festivals that the Athenians can impart fund from their newfound wealth. Um, we're going to see uh, the development of philosophy, um, uh, which uh, uh, in some ways is a product of the fact that um, uh, uh, members of the Athenian elite can afford to hire um, teachers of rhetoric, um, sophists, out of whom the kind of first uh, self-defined philosophers, in particular, particularly a circle around Socrates, emerges. Um, we're going to see um, uh, the development, really, of the first history, um, with, again, Herodotus starting to write in the 430s, and then um, uh, Thucydides um, picking up in the 420s and trying to write a very different kind of uh, history. Um, so, certainly, in terms of cultural output, um, this is going to be a, a massive efflorescence in the 4th century. Um, and, of course, and given that given it's the people who like cultural output who ultimately kind of defined Greek history, um, that's why we call this the classical age, the age of excellence, the golden age. Um, even if, I think, we, as we explore the sort of the dark underbelly of the Athenian Empire, um, we'll find that that efflorescence, that excellence, um, certainly does rest on a great deal of exploitation. Um, uh, uh, the exploitation of uh, people who had initially thought that they were allies of Athens against the Persians, and then increasingly find themselves reduced um, to um, subordinate, uh, be at first subordinate allies, and then um, quite simply subjects of the Athenians. So what we're going to be doing as we go forward is this week um, we'll be looking at the rise of the Athenian Empire, um, and again, we'll be looking simultaneously at the mechanics of that empire. And again, this is a paradox. This is an empire that is run by the most radically egalitarian democracy on the planet at this point. Um, and yet this egalitarian democracy, when it comes to the people outside of it, will prove um, at times uh, quite shockingly um, exploitative. Um, and then we'll also look at, uh, again, how the wealth that the empire creates, and also how the dynamics of the democracy itself, the free speech, the exchange of ideas, the, uh, the competition, uh, including the, competition, the uh, competitions of, uh, for uh, uh, choral works, for tragedies and comedies, um, how that very much, uh, <coughs> excuse me, how that very much um, uh, uh, will drive the development of the kind of advanced literary culture that people going forward will associate um, uh, with the so-called golden age of Athens. So this, does, this doesn't all happen at 479, um, but nonetheless, I think certainly um, we are moving into a period that feels very different geopolitically, with Athens being unquestionably one of the most important um, geopolitical powers. We're moving into a moment of the uh, uh, 
uh, increasingly uh, uh, the radicalization of the Athenian democracy, um, and we're moving into a moment that um, in some ways can be considered a kind of um, axial age um, for subsequent uh, Western Eurasian thought, um, in that we are going to see the development of history and philosophy um, and comedy and tragedy, um, and these models, in, in many instances, sub going to, to uh, inspire um, all work in those particular sort of generic um, silos um, that occurs afterwards. So um, hopefully uh, we're at a, at least a, an exciting transition, um, a, a transition towards a, a particularly dynamic moment in uh, Mediterranean history. Um, and so um, much more to come. Um, my goal is to probably upload three lectures a week. Um, these lectures will not be as long as the lectures that I give in class, um, but um, I hope to supplement them with, um, uh, uh, again, uh, either slides. I may even just post some kind of short notes that I have. Um, and I also hope that these lectures, uh, again, will help to inspire questions um, that you can reach via email and that I can even address in, uh, in subsequent videos. Um, and again, uh, you know, stay healthy, uh, take care of the people in your life that you need to take care of, and uh, we will commence um, with muddling through um, the rest of this semester. So we'll talk more soon. Bye.